Uh, my name is Patrick Krit. Uh, I have been doing Scala for more than 10 years. Uh, I'm the author of the Better Files Library, which is a popular I.O. library, and I wrote uh, the 2.13 collections uh, standard library array decks. So that's my background. Um, so the goals of this talk, uh, we're going to develop a toy web application. Um, we're going to only be using Scala for CSS, HTML, JavaScript, AJAX. Um, we'll have type safe RPCs. So this is the communication between the back end and the front end. Your AJAX calls would be type safe, which means uh, if you remove or change the signature of a back end API, your front end cannot make the AJAX call. It'll be a compiler error. Um, I'll also show uh, this kind of facilitates uh, front end back end code sharing. You can sh share your model classes, your uh, validation logic uh, between the front end and back end. And this is kind of hand wavy. Uh, I'm not going to show a lot of like abstractions. It's very vanilla, plain, uh, without fancy uh, monads or IO libraries. So vanilla skull. And it's relatively unopinionated. So uh, you can uh, you can throw you can if you want to be, have your favorite JSON serialization library, you can throw the one I'm showing out and bring you in. So this is um, uh, kind of bring your it's not. It's more. It's less about uh, a library and more about how you can structure your code. Yeah. So I'll be showing less than 100 lines of code. Okay. Let's get started. So um, I'm going to show an over-engineered mortgage calculator. So okay. So this is my Scala library, Scala code. I'm, I'm going to just start SBT dev. Um, and yeah, it starts the server. Okay, there you go. Uh, I mean, it was rendering fine because running of the local host is just uh, was ugly because it didn't have the bootstrap CSS library. Okay, anyway, so this is all written in Scala. Um, you can see when I hit calculate, it calculates my mortgage. Let's say I have a loan of $1 million, 5% APR, 30 years of mortgage, and it generates my interest and principal for the next 30 times 12, 360 months. Um, you can look at the network call. So it actually makes an AJAX call uh, with a particular payload. In this case, my APR, my number of years, and it gets back a response, uh, a JSON response. OK. All right. So how do we write this? So one way to think about it is to structure such a web such an application into four components. First is the framework. So this is the part you can imagine you would reuse across different projects. So if you're writing yet another uh, full stack Scala web application, you can throw it in there. So this is the library part, if you will. Second is kind of the shared module, which is the part where you want to share your validation logic, your model classes between the front end and back end. This is kind of obvious. This is the web part. This is your Scala.js and Scala.css. Um, and your fourth is your server, which is the backend server, which uh, in most cases does two things. It serves your static assets, your HTML and JavaScript, and it serves your data or has business logic, so it does computation. OK. Um, this is the build of the SBTs. You can see I'm defining the four uh, different uh, submodules for the project. Uh, one useful thing uh, I like to do is uh, register a command. So in this case, I registered a def command, which uh, formats my code. Uh, this tilde is like the watch operator, so it's like live reload. So when I change my code, it live reloads the back end and the front end. It does fast optimization JS, which, which takes your Scala JS code, compiles it to JavaScript, and it starts the server and waits for it to stop. It's pretty useful. So that's the command I ran back here. OK, um, uh, the libraries, again, I try to, I like to uh, organize them in these sections. So there's a Scala.js section. So this is related to using Scala.js, a Scala CSS. This is a DSL where, as I promised, I'd be writing Scala instead of CSS. So this is the libraries. Uh, the third section is the JavaScript wrappers. So many popular libraries like jQuery and React and Bootstrap have uh, Scala wrappers, Scala.js wrappers. So you, instead of directly using JavaScript, you can actually use the Scala APIs. 
Um, third, third, fourth would be the API layer. So this is the kind of the library layer, which actually takes care of serialization, deserialization, and comes, uh, is in charge of communication between back end and front end. And the fifth layer is the shared layer, which is your validation logic here. Um, in this case, I'm using Squans for validation. And the other two dependencies, so these are all Scala.js dependencies because these are shared between the web and the front end, uh, sorry, web and the shared modules. The back end, there's only two dependencies. I'm using cask and request, cask as my server and request is to make the request. And again, this is fairly an opinionated, like instead of cask, if you want play, you can throw that in there. Instead of requests, if you want some other library, you can. Okay, and this is just uh, taking the previous build.sbt and um, hooking up the dependencies that I defined here. All right, and this again goes over the structure. So as mentioned earlier, uh, it's four submodules. This is the framework part, which is uh, common across different projects. This is the backend server. Uh, the server has two parts, the router, which is in charge of serving static assets, CSS, uh, CSS, JavaScript, HTML, and your services layer, which is your business logic. Presumably this would be talking to your database or doing computation not possible in the front end. This is your shared module. So in here I have one, one so the shared module, usually you want to store your data model and validation logic, so you can share the same validation between back end and front end. And the last is the web module, which is, has your um, uh, HTML, so which looks like the this thing. <coughs> okay. So let's talk about the front end. So this is what ScholarJS looks like. So it's pretty neat library where you get these defs. Um, each def takes a variable number of arguments of other defs, and each of these def kind of mirror a HTML tag. You can define your custom tags, but it comes with common stuff like HTML, ahead, body, div, form, labels, buttons, things like that. Um, it also has this colon equal to sy syntax for setting a value to an attribute. Um, and if you actually do, uh, so this is pure Scala code. Um, it's actually your ID will autocomplete and s do suggestions. And uh, if you actually invoke webpage.html.render, you get back a string. The string is actually the HTML um, of the page. So you can see it looks very similar. Um, and why are we doing this? Uh, I'll get into that later. So one tiny annoyance is a lot of uh, HTML keywords, like class and for and type, are also Scala keywords, so you have to escape them using backticks. So it makes the code look a little weird, but uh, at least you're writing Scala. Okay, so this gets into the part. What was the, what's the point of doing this? Uh, so the biggest, besides having a strongly typed language uh, for writing HTML. Uh, the biggest use case would be uh, templating. So in this case, um, I, let's say you have a bunch of pages and they have the same head section and they all import kind of the similar uh, JavaScript libraries and scripts. So you can abstract that away. In this case, I have an abstract page class with a single abstract method, the render body, because that every page has a different body, but everything else is the same, and I kind of build it all up together on the first line render doc, which says HTML, and it has a head, and it has a body, and it has a bunch of scripts in the end. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, how I would be used writing a page, a Hello World page, which has a push button, uh, which when you push it, it just prints a random number. So a lot of the <coughs> construction of the page, the common part, the scripts, the header section, is happening in the super class, in the page class. Um, so, uh, one thing that I'd like to mention, uh, highlight here is this init method. So there's nothing really special about it. So I, you can see I'm using this j add js export tag uh, annotation. So this annotation tells the ScalaJS compiler that this should be available to invoke. So the ScalaJS does not actually expose every method to you for, uh, for you to call. Uh, you have to specifically whitelist either at the top level using at JS export top level or at def using JS export. So how is this called? So uh, you, I am actually calling it here within a script tag in name.init. 
Uh, I like to do this as, as a way to inject script. This is a very common pattern if you're using jQuery where you have, when you load a document, you attach a bunch of handlers using on ready event. So here, again, uh, when the page is loaded, I'm attaching a click handler to the button element here saying, do this thing. Um, this code actually looks like jQuery, but it's actually Scala, uh, it's Scala code. Uh, this is using a wrapper, uh, a Scala.js wrapper over jQuery. Um, and it's almost valid JavaScript code if you just copy and paste this in. Okay, um, how do we do dependency management? So uh, instead of using Gulp or Bower or one of those package managers, it's pretty common nowadays to actually use CDNs for dependency management. So in this case, I'm using JS Deliver. And this is all the thing. You need like three lines of code to do dependency management uh, using Scala or front-end JavaScript libraries. So I have this helpful defs, and this is how I use it. I'm just declaring that jQuery, I want to use version 3.2.1, and I get this back. Uh, some libraries like Bootstrap have uh, a CSS and a JavaScript that you have to import in. And one nice way to structure this using Scala objects so you can have this make sure you use the same bootstrap version for the CSS dependency and the JavaScript dependency. And how do you actually use them? You can see them here. You just do def JS libs and you import the jQuery and bootstrap and this gets packaged into uh, line 16 uh, and uh, in, the, in the dev scripts section. So you can see JS libs plus plus list, which is my custom scripts and it gets packaged into the HTML, uh, which gets rendered as the full HTML page. Okay. So this is all the markup for the mortgage calculator, uh, which is this thing. So this is all the markup that's needed for uh, writing the mortgage calculator web page. So this is the actual code that works. So this highlights one of the benefits of doing the template, the Scala route, or like a higher level programming language route, you can see that uh, I'm using this def input. It abstracts away a little, a common thing. So which each of my input elements, so in this case, loan, el loan amount, a default number, a label, and a text area. Um, it's actually like four lines of HTML or Scala. So if, and I have four inputs here, so that would be 16 lines of code, but I'm actually only writing four li lines of code because I have a def that uh, abstra abstracts away the repeat repetitive part of the code. So this is very similar to HTML templating, but I'm just using vanilla Scala defs. So this is super useful um, when writing the, uh, m your markup in Scala. Okay, uh, so what happens when I click calculate, this, this button? So again, as usual, I'm attaching a click handler I'm using the jQuery wrapper, I'm saying um, when I click on this, on the, on, on the click event on this element, call this def. And this def actually looks very similar to the jQuery def, it takes in an element and the event. Uh, most of the time you don't need it because you know it happened on this thing. And the event is like, was, was it a right click or a press down click, things like that. Um, so there's nothing interesting happened here except these two lines. So uh, what I'm doing is I am reading the, my various uh, values, like the loan amount, the APR, the years, out of uh, the HTML elements. These lines 14 through 16 look a little ugly because I'm typecasting first uh, a JS element to a string, and then I'm doing integer.parsint. That's what two, dot two int option does. Um, you can write type classes, read type classes to get around this. You can say like given an instance of a JavaScript element, can I read an integer, can I read a string? But it's, it's okay, it's a little ugly, but this is what it looks like. So the, mag the magic happens here. So I'm creating an instance of a mortgage uh, class and I'm calling, calling mortgage.api.payments. But guess what? This is not actually being executed in the front end. This is actually making an Ajax call. Um, but it doesn't look like I'm making an Ajax call. It looks like I'm calling a Scala def. So I'll show you how, do, how, how we're doing that. Okay, so this is the shared code. So the nice thing about having everything in Scala, you can share your backend and frontend models. So in this case, I have a mortgage class and a principal class. Um, and this is my API. So I have two API, let's say I have a payments API, which takes in a mortgage, returns a sequence of payments, 
and, and a refinance API to extend a mortgage and a new rate and tells me how much penalty I should be willing to pay to go for the new rate. Um, but obviously I can't do that because this is just vanilla Scala and uh, this thing is actually making Ajax calls. So we have to rewrite it using this framework.rpc. I'll show that. It, the RPC is like 40 lines of code. I'll show that. So instead of having uh, def input output, I have an RPC with input and output parameters and a path that it lives in. Again, these are all unopinionated. You can make it live at any other path. So uh, for this method, which takes in two things, a mortgage and a double, and returns a double, it has a tuple of mortgage and double as the first type parameter and the output type as the next type parameter. OK, so that's, let's implement this RPC class. So the RPC class has two type parameters, input and output. Um, it has read, read writer. So if, again, the read writer is a type class that says that I can read the input and serialize and deserialize the input from JSON and to JSON, respectively. Uh, I'm using new pickle, but if you use any other JSON library, they all come out there, type classes, which denotes this effect. So that's not interesting. And it has a single apply method, which takes in an input and returns a future of the output. OK, how should we imp implement it? That's it. That's, that's all we need to do. So we need to just do an ajax.post. We're going to post it at the path that we said this API lives at. This write takes in the instance of input, makes it a JSON, <laughs> sticks in the JSON headers. And when we get back the response, uh, we read the output back from the text back into the output object. And this is, it compiles, and this is all the code there is. But OK, what if we didn't want to do post? What if we wanted to do gets and deletes? Uh, that's pretty easy. You just need to pass in an extra method saying what HTTP method this. So earlier here, uh, we said this API lives here, and we just assumed it was post. But if you just said, no, 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 it's not a post. It's a get uh, that lives here. So this is all you need to do. Uh, the only thing is, instead of now encoding JSON encoding the input into the body, you have to pass it as URL parameters because gets don't really have bodies. Um, but that's pretty, also pretty easy again using type classes. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, let's assume we're doing posts. But it's pretty easy to extend this to gets, to do your gets, posts, puts, and deletes. Yeah. OK, that's the get. Um, yeah, so this is the JSON read write. Nothing interesting here. Most Scala JSON serialization libraries comes with these macros, which can serialize, deserialize case classes. You just have to stick this implicit, which tells the compiler that my models can be written to JSON or read back from JSON. <clears throat> this is also not the interesting part. This is the service layer. So this actually runs in the back end and does the mortgage calculation. Obviously, this could have left it, lived in the front end, but then this talk wouldn't be that interesting. So this lives in the back end. Uh, and gets invoked via Ajax calls from the front end. This is the server. So this serves the static assets. I'm using Cask, but again, this talk doesn't really, is opinionated about using Cask. You can use your favorite web serving library like Play. In this case, I'm saying the index, which lives at without any path, serves the render doc, which uh, takes my mortgage calculator.scala, which is my using Scala DSL to describe HTML and just sends out the string of the HTML. For static files uh, requesting under JavaScript, I'm literally ser serving it out of the SBT compilation directory. Um, and I have a flag here whether I'm doing fast optimization or the full optimization because Scala.js can compile your Scala code to JavaScript in two different ways. And maybe I want to switch it based on if I'm in the prod environment or am I doing dev locally. Um, this is the interesting part where I have, where I'm routing the APIs. Like, how do I, now that I have defined my APIs using the RPC class, how do I make them actually live as AJAX objects? So there's only two things to keep in mind here. There's the rpc.wire method, and there's this squiggly, squiggly arrow. And I'll go over both of them. OK, so let's go over the wire method. It's actually pretty trivial. So. I define a request handler. This is a very useful object to define. It's a partial f function from a request to a resp response, which says, given a request, I may be able to satisfy it and respond back to you. Um, and wire, all it does, it takes a variable number of such partial functions and tries the first one. If not, tries the second one. If not, tries the third one. Else says, 
I could not satisfy this request. So that's all this does, it's one line of code. So this rpc.wire is this thing. So obviously that means this squiggly arrow has to be a partial function. So, so this squiggly arrow is a partial function. So mind you, this on the left side, this is an instance of the RPC class. So because we defined our RPCs, we defined our RPCs like this. So these are instances of the RPC class. So. And on the right side are actually the backend implementation. So we are saying this API is implemented by this back backend function. Um, and it's all type safe because uh, I define my RPCs of particular I and O type, particular input and output type, and it can only be implemented by a function of I and O. So it will be a compiler error if I mismatch my backend function with the uh, front end API definition. And how is this, and wh how does this work? So it says, oh, I will be able to execute it if the request, incoming request, is the, has the path of which this RPC was declared at. So if request path matches my expected path, then <clears throat> I'll try to JSON parse the input data. Uh, if I cannot pass it, parse it, the, then it's a bad request, so that means the front end made an API call with a bad body. And if I was able to parse it into an instance of I, I will try to apply the function that was told is the backend implementation. And again, two things can happen. Either this function executed successfully, then I will serialize the result and send it out, or the function threw an error, which is really bad because your backend function then crashed. So then it, I would send out a um, 500 error code. And that's all there too is. This is seven lines of code, and that's it. Uh, I have a full stack Scala uh, web application. I swear I did not hide any lines of code. Um, okay, so what are the use cases? So the best use case for this kind of thing is for if you already have a Scala application, then you can stick this maybe like 50 lines of code, and you don't have to have separate APIs and a separate front end to do admin or admin operations. So if you have like a long running service or microservices and you want to do batch of uh, admin operations, like look at it or look at the status of it or have a nice uh, panel to sh for internal dev purposes, uh, it's really to throw this in there. And you don't have to worry about keeping the API in sync because you'll get a compile error if you, um, mess if you like have a new route or you refactored your code. Um, and you don't have to have like a separate deployment of like your front end, uh, like a HTML JavaScript app. Another thing is you can share a lot of logic between back end and front end, so if you have a lot of complex validation, you can <coughs> have it both in your web application and in your back end, and obviously you can do fun stuff, uh, personal projects. Um, I'm, I don't have time, so this is like a quick demonstration of 20 lines of a validation library. So. One use case of this is to have shared validations. So imagine you have, have like a validation for a strong password and you can put that logic in the front end and also in the back end. And yeah, so uh, in this is an example where I have a case class address and <coughs> I declare a bunch of validators saying, oh, the zip must be so and so, a country code must be valid, and a person can have an address and the address inside the person must also be valid, and that's all there to it. So, and now you can, uh, I'll show you how to use the same validation, uh, implicit validators that I declared for a person case class and an address case class. Um, so, uh, so this is the squiggly arrow function from earlier, and all you need to do is uh, this extra, stick in this extra three lines of code. So by default you can say I don't have a validator for my input. Uh, but if you do, uh, when you JSON parse the input, you run it through the validation and you respond back if it fails, you respond back with a bad request. So that's all there is to do shared validations. Um, again, the use case is your front end may not be using the front end code to make the AJAX call. Someone might be using curl, so you still need to validate the logic. So uh, this enables to have the same logic being sh executed twice, both while making the API call and in the server side. <coughs> yeah, so that's an example where I'm validating my mortgage object 
in the RPC. Um, yeah, so there's also this library, Scala CSS. So as promised, I won't be writing any non-Scala code, so I have to write CSS in Scala, so this is a DSL. Uh, again, you can stick it in the abstract page class, so this particular lines of code compiles down to this CSS. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting library. It, um, you, can, you can do a lot of cool things with it, because in, uh, one problem with CSS is variables. You have a lot of variables that uh, other CSS objects depend on, but now that you're writing Scala, you can abstract all that away and have CSS variables for free. Um, uh, the last thing is, as mentioned earlier, this as instance of string, then parsent is kind of annoying. Uh, you can get, you ideally want to write something like this, or even have uh, type classes where you can just, given a bunch of input elements, you can materialize an instance of mod gauge. Um, you can have a JS read type class, which uh, given a uh, JavaScript, a Scala.js input el uh, element, it can materialize um, strings, ints, and even case classes. So uh, this is an example of it. This is all the code there to it. Um, so that makes this part of the code much easier to read. Um, yeah, so let's go over. So I showed you the framework uh, module. So this is the module that you may want, is the library part of the code which you may want to share across different projects. So the JSLibs is the part which does the CDN dependency management. This is the type class to read uh, JavaScript objects into Scala case classes. Uh, this is my abstract page class. This is the RPC class, and this is my validation library. And on the server, I have the router, which serves static assets. And in my services section under the server, I have the business logic, which in this case is actually implements the mortgage API and calculus payments. My shared module has the mortgage case class and the RPC defined and the validation logic defined. Um, and my web is this mortgage calculator.scala, which is the Scala.js DSL of the HTML. And that's all the code. Um, you can go check this out. I think this is a good uh, starter project if you want to start your own. Uh, feel free to fork it. Um, that's it. Yeah, so it's a much easier value prop when you already have a backend in that language. Then, and especially for admin tools where like, if you have a company where you have a front user facing and obviously you have a front end team managing that, but you have this backend services where you don't want to bother the front end team to go implement it. It's a super easy value sell to the development team. Be like, hey, like, just, just do this extra 100 lines of code and you have pretty cool. Yeah, um, for actually like going all the way, I don't know if I would do that, but definitely in my company we use our, uh, the internal admin pages are served by, out by the server side, by the scholars. Have you, have you run the from the library, uh, the designer, the Yeah, yeah, intention, obviously we do use that, but for this purpose of the talk, I wanted to keep it the. Have you found one that was like, that was actually functioning program? Yeah, laminar, yeah. One more. Oh, uh, just uh, one of the Scala JS libraries. They, I think they released it one month ago, so I haven't updated my slide. I made it like right before that. So yeah, I should be porting it over to Scala three. Yeah. 